ROHS is originally a European Union uh, directive that sets restrictions on uh, heavy metals and now also phthalates in electronic components. So let's say that I would, for whatever reason, start uh, selling remote controls. <laughs> Not a business I recommend that you get into. But in any case, let's say I would start selling these remote controls and I would have to ensure that the components, not just the parts that I touch, but also the internal components don't contain any substance above the set limit that are on the, let's say, restricted list. And, and this list, at least in the EU, it, it includes lead, it includes cadmium, hexavalent, chromium, etc. You can find the list on our website um, and, and a list of phthalates. And I think, I think the limitation, at least in the EU, is 0.1% um, of the weight of the component or something like that. Um, in more recent years, the ROHS, well, I wouldn't say the ROHS directive, but the, the concept of ROHS has been adopted by many other countries, uh, including the, the United States, but not as a federal regulation, at least not yet, but uh, on, on a state level in the US. And I'm gonna have to read it from my phone because I can't remember everything. But some of the states include California, New Jersey, Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, New York, Rhode Island, and Wisconsin. And I'm not, I'm not sure if, if these are all the states uh, that have some sort of ROHS regulation or uh, ROHS standard in, 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 in place, but as, as yeah, these are quite, uh, let's say, significant when it comes to uh, potential market size and, 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 and so on, right? So what this means is that if you are importing or manufacturing electronics in the US uh, and, and selling this for the US market, while well, selling this in the US market, then you would really need to consider ensuring ROHS uh, uh, compliance, uh, given that it is a requirement in, in, in these states. Um, what this means in, in, in practice is that you need to inform your supplier to only use ROHS components. In the EU, well, the ROHS directive in the EU, it dates back to, I think, 2004, and it has really, let's say, changed the, 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 the supply chain when it comes to uh, electronic components. And what I mean by this is that today, you can have the same type of component manufactured as ROHS compliant and non-ROHS compliant, okay? And a non-ROHS compliant can contain substances above the set limit, and these would naturally be cheaper to produce, I can't go into details as to why this is the case. And, and these components could be used for devices that are uh, destined for countries without ROHS requirements. Such countries, is, we're not just talking about the EU member states and, United, and some US states, but there are ROHS requirements uh, today in Korea, in India, I think also in China now. So it's sort of becoming the standard, but my understanding is that there are still, you know, they are still floating around there, these ROH, non-ROHS compliant components. Um, so what this means is that there is a risk that your supplier could try to save some money by using non-ROHS compliant components. The risk is, if we go back to this remote control, that it's not just one component, obviously. It's, it's I can't say, but it could be, if you you know you count the PCB and so on, and everything that goes on the PCB, it can be hundreds of different components that go into 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 a single device, right? And one single non ROHS component could potentially uh, render the entire product as, as non compliant. So what this means is that you have to be very clear to your supplier that they must only use ROHS compliant uh, components. Okay. However, it can be hard to verify. You can't just trust your supplier, obviously, but it can still be hard to verify if they are actually using ROHS compliant components. In a, in a perfect world, they would be able to provide some sort of traceability or some t test reports that, that, pr that prove they're only using ROHS compliant components. But unfortunately, 
we don't simply don't have that level of supply chain transparency at, at this time that there is test reports for every every single component in, in in place even for some of the larger component manufacturers and i've been reaching out to myself a couple of times to request test reports you simply they simply don't respond back to you maybe they don't have it maybe they just don't bother unless you're like amazon or uh, sorry samsung or apple or whatever right um, so it is, I know from experience that it can really be hard to obtain test reports, even, even from brand components. I'm not, not going to mention any, any brand now, but I know that from experience. So what often happens is that in order to demonstrate compliance, in order to show, well, in order to verify that you, you are compliant with these uh, US state level ROHS uh, regulations, you need third party testing. And, and, and yeah, that can be costly. As, as there can be a fairly large number of components that, that simply need to be tested. Maybe you can also find some, some sort of hybrid that, let's say you can find test reports for, well, you can get test reports, not find, but actually get test reports from say 60% of the components that maybe you, you can get away, well, get away with uh, getting testing for the remaining 40% or, or, or something like that. Another Another option is that instead of let's say transferring the responsibility and uh, well yeah let's say transferring the trust uh, to your supplier to procure ROS compliant components you could also consider to go directly to component suppliers in say China uh, or, or Vietnam or something like that and, and, and make sure that you verify uh, test reports at the source this can be very time consuming but this could save you on testing costs uh, if you get better control of your supply chain in that sense so that you you can be fairly certain that you are buying bad components even if as said it can also be more expensive that way but if you can if you can secure test reports at the source then this could really save you long term as demonstrating ROHS compliance for the US may not be a matter of getting testing arranged one time. It will need retesting at some point, uh, either because it's been too long since you since you did the first test or because let's say that New York would suddenly decide, that, oh, now we're gonna throw in these phthalates, so they're gonna reduce the limit or something like that, okay? In which case your test reports would all of a sudden be, be rendered uh, outdated in, in, in that case. And that also leads me to another uh, another topic that I want to bring up in the context of ROHS regulations for the United States. And by contrast, in the European Union, we have, well, our, the ROHS directive tells us that it applies to, I think, all, uh, elect uh, well, all electronic equipment and electrical equipment, okay? So all electronics, be it this uh, remote that I keep using for some reason, uh, or this microphone, or even my wristwatch here, all has to be uh, ROHS compliant. In the US, it differs. Um, it differs depending on, on the state. So in the California ROHS law, apparently, according to our research, this could be outdated, could be wrong, but uh, what is written here is that it applies to uh, ray tube containing devices, CRTs, computer monitors containing CRTs, LCD containing laptops, LCD containing desktop monitors, televisions containing CRTs, plasma TVs, portable DVD players with LCD screens. And my understanding is that at least at some point, uh, this could have been updated since we wrote that article. We may even have been looking at outdated sources but but this as as, as as you can as you can hear is let's say far more limiting in scope than, than compared well compared to the uh, the, the European Union uh, version of ROHS the original in if I can use that term um, as it covers all electronics so that's something you need to look at when it comes to the the scope of these various uh, state level ROHS regulations in the US is uh, is my product on the list that may or may not be the case other than that my understanding is that they um there are also limitation well limits in in terms of which substances are actually on the restricted list so in in eu can't remember what is it is it 14 or 15 different substances 
And what I see here is that in, say, California, it only includes four lead, mercury, cadmium, and hexavalent chromium. Okay, so that's, again, it's more limited in scope as compared to, to the EU version. My recommendation, though, that in the end, I don't think you, as, as a brand owner, as a manufacturer, as an importer, should actually make these assessments on your own be it uh, if your product fit the scope or be it the specific substances and the corresponding limits. Now, my recommendation is that you go to a qualified testing company like Kima, like uh, Intertech or Eurofins or SGS, something like this, right? Or UL in the US. I'm sure they got some sort of ROHS testing program and simply ask them, is my product within the scope of one or more ROHS regulations in the United States? If yes, uh, what are the substance limits to take into consideration and just take it from there. And usually this is something that they can provide free of charge when you request a quotation. So don't think you really have anything to lose. But um, yeah, in any case, ROHS is, um, is, is still something to take into consideration if you're importing or manufacturing uh, electronics in the United States. Right, so if you've got more questions about ROHS, you can read the article for starters and you can write additional comments in, in, well, in the comment section. And you can do the same if you're watching this on YouTube and you can, of course, subscribe for more videos from ComplianceGate. So, bye for now.